This next song that we're going to do is probably going to be completely new to most everybody, but it's very, very simple, and uh, the words to it are very, very true. Um, so as we, as we sing this together, uh, as, as the Church of Christ, I want, I want you guys to sing from your hearts, and, and if, if you feel led to, raise your hands, close your eyes. Sing from the depths of your soul that, that we love Jesus, that he is who he says he is. Thank you. 
season, we're reminded that his perfect life was the life that we needed to die on the cross for us and raise from the dead so that we could move from being an enemy of God to a friend of God. Lord, I pray that this morning your word would be true in our lives, God, that it would speak to us. And Lord Jesus, that we could walk out of here today with the knowledge and understanding and treat you like a friend because you call us friend if we are a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, everybody needs a friend. I heard a story about an old high school football coach in West Texas where football is king and he wasn't doing so good. His team was losing game after game after game and two games left in the season. He just looked at his wife and he said, babe, I just don't feel like I have any friends. The only friend I feel like I've got is my dog. And a guy's got to have more than one friend. His wife looked at him, went out and bought him another dog. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to be his friend when they're losing, right? Have you ever felt that way in your life where things aren't going so well for you? They're not going so hot and you don't feel like anybody is in your corner. Well, the Word of God tells us that you might feel alone, but if you're a Christian, God never leaves you, He never forsakes you, and He wants to call you friend. You know, a relationship with God is why Jesus came to the earth. Back in the Old Testament, before Jesus was on the scene, the relationship with God was mostly funneled through the temple and through sacrifices and through worship of God at the temple. Before the temple was built, God had a relationship with guys like Moses and Abraham. And he had a relationship with Adam and Eve where they walked in the garden. But sin disrupted all of that. And as a result, we need Jesus. We need his perfect life for our sinless lives. We need him to be inside of us, to live in us, and through us, we need Jesus so that we can have a relationship with God. And this is open for everybody. Back in the Old Testament, the main way that God had a relationship was through his people, the people of Israel. Today, Jews, Greeks alike, and Greeks categorizes anyone who's not a Jew. They have access to God. As a pastor, I always joke around about my red phone that I've got at the house. You know, I pick it up to talk to God. It's a direct line. But you can have a red phone to God, too. It's not something that's reserved for the spiritually elite. It's not something that is reserved for pastors and ministry staff only. A relationship with God is possible for all people. And I wonder how some of us come to God in that relationship. Maybe we grew up with this perspective that God was kind of a vindictive God in heaven with lightning bolts, and he's just got them ready. He's got a whole quiver of lightning bolts that he's ready to shoot down and cast down to us when we make a mistake, when we sin, when we are busted. And maybe we view our relationship with God like that, that he's kind of standoffish. You know, there's religions out there that they say you can't have a relationship with God. In fact... That would be unholy. That I wouldn't be right to have a relationship with God. In fact, God's distant. He is set apart in a way where you can't have a relationship with him. You just need to appease him. You need to do right and wrong. You need to hope that your right outweighs your wrong. Many of our major religions are based upon that very principle. Other belief systems believe that maybe God just wound the earth up like a clock and set it in motion and stepped away and said, have at it. 
But the Bible teaches that God is very engaged in our lives. He longs to be close to us and to have a friendship with us and to have a relationship with us. And I don't know how you view your relationship with God. Maybe some of you view him like a vending machine. You're going to come up to the vending machine. In the vending machine of God, there's all these different things that you need, that you want, and you desire. And so when you need, want, or desire God, you come to God, and that's your relationship. You come up to him, and you take a look, and there's things like peace that he offers. And so you press D12 for peace, and you take peace home with you. And, and, and maybe you need some strength for the day. And so you go back to the vending machine of God, and you get what you need from God. You kind of view it as a one-way relationship where God's got something for you, and he's there to give it to you. Maybe some of you guys can relate to the analogy that God is like a gas station. You know, you come to the gas station when you're on empty. And if you're like me growing up, when gas was 88 cents a gallon, you could milk that thing for all it was worth. And you get gas all the time. You go to the gas station. But nowadays, you know, you're hoping that your gas tank will last the week. If it lasts the week, you're good because you're paying like $17 a gallon now. And so you view God like a filling station, okay? You fill up at the beginning of the week, church, Sunday. You, you come, you fill up at the beginning of the week, and then that carries you on through the rest of the week. And by the end of the week, you haven't had your dose of God. You haven't had your dose of church. And so you're feeling the need. You're starting to get frustrated. You're starting to get anxious. You're starting to allow the attacks of the world to... to to pressure you, and, and you just can't wait until that next Bible study. You cannot wait until the next church service so that you can get filled up again. And you view God maybe as a gas station. Or maybe you view God and your relationship with Him like I like to view Him. Like a cell phone. A smartphone. Yeah, I like this picture, this analogy, because you can take your phone with you wherever you go. You can do anything you want on it. You can pay for your Starbucks on it. You can look at your friend list on your Facebook. You can communicate. You can talk on your phone. You can read on your smartphone. You can learn about the things of life on your phone. You can do almost anything. It goes with you everywhere. You check it every single day. It's the first thing that you look at in the morning. You make sure and check it regularly throughout the day just to make sure you haven't missed any notification. It's a way to live your life through your cell phone. When you don't have your cell phone, you feel a little bit naked. You feel exposed. You don't have that phone with you, and so you feel a little bit empty. So you make sure you take it with you everywhere you go. You know, these are all different analogies of how we can view our relationship with God. Maybe some of you guys view it like this. It's a coffee shop, a destination coffee shop, where you're going to come in, you're going to set aside time in your day. And you're going to walk into the coffee shop, you're going to relax. You're not going to feel pressured. You, you're not going through the drive through today. You're going to sit down. You've got a nice book that you want to read, and you just want to relax. You want to take, take your time and be, be kind of comfortable, and you're going to spend about an hour there. That's what coffee shops want you to do, these destination places. They want you to come in, and they want you to enjoy yourself. They want you to stay. It's about the experience. And maybe some of you, you view your relationship with God like that. Every day, you try and make time for God, and you're going to come in, and you're going to experience a destination moment with God, but when you're done with that, you leave him behind. Well, the Bible describes our relationship with him as a friend. And each of those analogies is a different level of friendship. Maybe you see him as that vending machine, and you've got that friendship that's one way. You just want something from somebody. I heard a great saying. He said, here's how you know when someone's your friend. They invite you to do something. If you're always asking, 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 it's a one-way friendship. Or, 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 or maybe it's simply like this, where you're seeing your friendship with God as that, that, that the gas station that's fill up. Or maybe it's a destination spot. Or maybe it is the cell phone analogy. Whatever it is. You can define your own level of friendship with God. You get to set that pace. God invites you into an intimate, deep friendship. One that is characterized by a loving relationship where you know each other. You spend time with each other. You enjoy each other's company. And in John chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, we're going to see this described. 
Open up to John 15, starting in verse 1 with me. And this is one of the I am statements that Jesus describes himself as. These I am statements refer back to analogies of God from the Old Testament. Pictures of God from the Old Testament. This is one where it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. This is God's Son, Jesus, as the true vine, the giver of life for the relationship. And God the Father is the vine dresser. In Jeremiah 6, verse 9, it says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, They shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel, like a great gatherer passes your hand again over its branches. This is Jesus saying, I'm that. I'm the vine. God the Father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine, and I long to have a relationship with you. Verse 2 says this, every branch that comes off of the vine, we can look at that as relationship. Every friendship with God that comes off of the vine. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. So there's this relationship that God has with his people. And the relationship goes like this. If you are a part of the vine, God's going to use you to bear fruit. And if you need pruning, he's going to prune you. We're terrible in our backyard with our bushes, our trees, and our flowers. I do a terrible job of gardening. I did not go to college, and I did not get a horticulture degree. I just kill everything in my backyard. I blame it all on the freeze from 1922. You know? <laughs> oh, the freeze got the rose bushes. Oh, the freeze got the evergreens. Oh, the freeze got the grass. Oh, the freeze got the dirt. Sorry. There's, you know, I can't even grow dirt. But the plants that do survive, I trim. I prune. Or when they're getting a little out of hand, I bring them back. Junipers are everywhere in Albuquerque. They drive me nuts because of my allergies. But you can, you can shape a juniper to look beautiful. And that's what God does with us. He prunes us so that we can be more fruitful. We've got cherry trees in our backyard. And, and every year we've got to cut away and prune those cherry trees. And if we don't, they won't bear any fruit. Two years ago, we didn't prune our cherry trees. Last year, we did not have cherries on our trees. Our little four and a half year old just looked at those trees every day. Where are the cherries, Daddy? Daddy messed those up. You got to prune them. And God does that with us. There are things in our life, there are things in our relationship with God where God just goes, you know what, I'm just going gonna, gonna to help you out in this area, okay? I'm your strength. I'm going to prune you. You feel really weak right now. I'm going to prune you, and I want to bring you back to the remembrance that, yes, I'm your strength, and you find your strength from me, not from yourself, or, or you're struggling in a certain area with sin in your life. You're, you just lash out at people, or, or maybe you, you cuss at coworkers, and when things don't go your way, you're struggling with greed or pornography or whatever. And God goes, I'm going to cut away that which is not fruitful. I'm going to prune it because I want our relationship to bear fruit. Verse 3 says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So there's these two Greek words, prune and clean. And they both have the very same Greek root word here. And what we see here is that you've got to be clean and you've got to be pruned. You've got to be clean to have a relationship with God. And your sin makes you dirty. Because of your sin, because of my sin, it makes us dirty. And we need to be cleansed by God. It says, already you are clean. So Jesus is addressing those who are in Christ, who have a relationship with God, who have found salvation. That's where the relationship with God begins. That's the genesis of the relationship. Verse 11 of chapter 13 in the book of John says, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. You know, this passage of scripture here is discussing and alluding to Judas as the betrayer. Who was not clean. Who did not have a relationship 
with Jesus that was characterized by friendship. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. It was Judas that led the men to take Jesus away to the cross. Verse 4 then talks to those who are clean. It says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. This word abide has got several different meanings here. It's the Greek word minnow. And it starts off by saying one of the first means is to have a relationship with God, to have salvation, to remain in Christ. It's the same word abide you can think of as remain. Some translations say if you remain in me and I in you. And this idea is the second one is to persevere, to last, to remain for a long time. Now, the third definition here kind of combines the two of them. That you have a relationship with God that's going to be long-lasting. That you remain in Christ. Because we all know, no Christian is perfect. If you're coming in as a, as a skeptic of Christianity, and, and you see Christians who make mistakes all the time, and you say they are hypocrites, guess what? You're correct. We are hypocrites. We all are. Because we are humans. We say we want to live for God and we say our lives are about Christ and that we want to be about the good in life. But we all know that we make mistakes time and time again. We stray from the relationship with God. And what this verse is calling us to do is to remain in Christ, to abide in Christ, to come back to our relationship with Christ. See, without faith, no life of God will come to anyone and without the life of God, no real fruit can be produced. You need God in your life to bear fruit, to produce fruit, to have results. So that the world says, yeah, I see there are a bunch of hypocrites. But you know what? There's something special and different about those hypocrites. There is. There's something special and different about those hypocrites. They're willing to admit their faults. They're willing to... Fess up to their mistakes. They're willing to do things that seem sacrificial. They're willing to take food to the homeless. They're willing to go build houses for people who don't have houses. They're willing to go on mission trips to bring medical aid to people. They're willing to serve me in my time of need, making me a dinner when I've got a family member who is in the hospital. They're different because they bear fruit. Because while they stray, they go back to the vine, the life giver. They go back to Jesus. And he remains in them. And he does something in them. Verse 5 says this. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. That's Christians. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from God, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown in the fire and burned. That's talking about a person like Judas, who is not an original Christian, who is not a believer. Verses 5 through 6, we see this continually abiding and remaining in Christ. Verse 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. I mean, that's a pretty powerful passage of Scripture that unlocks the key to God and His power. You see what that says? If you're walking with God, if you're abiding in Christ, if you're having a relationship and a friendship with God, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, that's some powerful prayer right there. I've seen God move in ways where only he can get the glory and the credit. We've prayed prayers here at Anchor Church where we've seen God do the miraculous. I mean, we've seen him heal people. We've seen him be a God of restoration. We've seen him be a God that provides. I mean, just this week, we were donated a soundboard. We were donated partitions and we were given a room this week for free. But then the APS computer lab took that room and brought in like 20 Mac computers. He said, that room that you had, you can't have that room anymore. You've got to change the whole flow. 
But the week before, God had given us dividers. So now we have enough room to divide out our rooms that are brand new so that our children can worship in a fun, clean, safe environment where they can hear about Jesus. God knew what was going to happen before it even happened. And he provided for us. Because every week we're saying, God, we need you. We need you. Lead us as a church. The thing about being a portable church is there's always going to be some kind of change. We have to be flexible. That's in the nature of being a guest in somebody else's home. And God is at work providing. And we can ask him. You've got a sick family member right now. Someone who's going through some pretty difficult pain in their life. God's word says, if you abide in me, that's the key. You've got to be in a right relationship with God. You've got to be in the kind of relationship with God that says, God, I want your way and your will, not mine. I want to be a part of the vine. I want to be a part of the power. And if you're walking with God, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Because when you abide in Christ, you are living out the will of God for your life. And why would God withhold his will from you? He won't. And here's why he does this. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. There's two great parts here. It says, by this, God's glorified. When you abide in me, when you remain in Christ, when you walk with God, God is glorified. And people see that he's the one who did the work. He see, people see that you're a disciple of God. It's visible. Verse 9 says this. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Verse 11 says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be filled. Jesus is saying, I'm the ultimate example here. I followed the will of the Father. And he, he was saying this because he knew that he would go to the cross and die for the sins of humanity. He knew what was in front of him, and he knew how to do the will of the Father. Anytime you ask Jesus what he's doing, he's saying, I'm doing the will of the Father. I'm following God's commands. I'm doing what he wants. And he says this in verse 11, and it says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. Did you guys know that when you follow God's plan for your life, it's for your benefit? It is for your benefit. Oftentimes we see barriers to our life, we see rules to our life as things that are keeping us from having fun. Right? We see them as things that are keeping us from having fun. But God's saying right here, these things are here so that you will be protected and that you can enjoy life to its fullest. John 10.10 10 says the thief, Satan, he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The Satan, his ways, his plans for your life is to rob you of joy, to kill your joy, to destroy any joy that you can have. But God's plan, the rest of the verse says, but I, Jesus, have come so they may have life and life abundantly. When I look at that verse and I see who God is, it's, it's, it's an easy decision for me. Do I follow God or do I follow Satan? What Satan wants for me is to destroy my life. What God wants for me is to bring joy to my life. Ultimate joy. Verse 12 says this, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. This is the picture here that God is giving for us. He's saying, okay, if you remain me, you follow what I say. And it's not a list of rules of do's and don'ts here. But I've got a relationship I offer to you. And if you just hang out with me, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You know, he's saying that you will bear much fruit. That you'll be successful. You'll have fruit that's produced. And that you'll find great joy and satisfaction from that. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to love people the way I've loved you. I followed my father's commands. 
I did what he asked me because I love you. Now I want you to do the same for everybody that you encounter. It's simple. Love God and love others. That's the two greatest commandments right there wrapped up into each other. To love the Lord your God and to love people as yourself. To treat your neighbor as yourself. That is the two commandments brought right together here. And when you do that, the world just goes, what? Why, why are you treating me this way? Well, because this is what God did for me. I can't help but treat you this way. There's a story in the book of Virtues. And William Bennett tells a story of Damon and Pythias. And these two have become best of friends since childhood. And one day their friendship was put to the test when Dionysius, the rule of Syracuse, in the 4th century B.C. was angry that Pythias was talking badly about kings who ruled by absolute power. And he says, you can either recant your words or you can die. And he says, I can't recant my words. I will die. But I have one request. I'd like to send my best friend as a surety that he will go in my place. He will stay right here with you. And I can go back to my home country and I can tell my wife and children I love them and goodbye. And if I don't return, you can put my best friend's life at the stakes. You can take his life. And his friend willingly stepped in his place. And he did return and relieve him of that duty. But isn't it great to know that we have a friend who stood in our place and his name was Jesus. And he didn't retreat, but he stood up for us. When no one else would. He stood by our side. When we were facing death. Verse 13 says. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. And that's pretty sacrificial. You are my friends. If you do what I command you. God wants to call you friend. He wants a relationship with you. You want to know if you're a friend of God? Do you do the things that God asks you to do? I'm not saying to be perfect. I'm not perfect. We found that out very quickly this morning. But when God asks you to repent from that sin, do you turn back to Him and repent? You say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Change me. When He says, hey, I need you to step up. I want you to serve in this area. Or I want you to do this and this seems radical. And I can't believe that anybody would ask me to do this. And it just seems absurd that I would maybe leave a career path that I worked my whole life towards to follow you and go down this different direction. Or oh, I need to walk in obedience in my relationship with you. And so some of these relationships that I've been carrying along, the things I've been doing, I've got to shut that down to follow you and be obedient to you. If you're doing those things, and walking obedience, God's going to say, yes, you are my friend. Verse 15 says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. A servant back in this time didn't have a choice. A servant was put in that position. But a friend, now that person could choose the friendship. Remember the first friend that you made? Remember, it's pretty easy when you were younger. It's a lot harder today. To make friends as you're older. But it's reciprocal, isn't it? It's something that you choose. There's some people out there who say, I'm not going to be that person's friend. I remember I was at the gym one day. Guys like to pump the iron in front of the mirrors. They enjoy that. You know, they like to watch themselves lift. Ah, I pick things up. I go to down. Ah. And I remember watching a guy. He got down on his knee. He looked at that mirror. Hey! 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 He did three sets of ten of strikes. 
And then did three sets, sets of ten. Ball. Ball. <laughs> that was his workout. <laughs> Strikes some balls. He watched himself in the mirror. I thought to myself, I'm not sure I'm going to be friends with that guy. <laughs> I choose to let him do his own thing at the gym. When you're a friend, you get to choose that. And God is not this forceful God in heaven saying, you will be my friend. You know, it's funny watching my kid at the playground. You know, they'll run up to children. And they kind of have that mentality. All the kids do. Let's be friends. You'll be my friend. And, and they're kind of forceful at times. And they hug them. And like, I just met you. Whoa, slow down, you know? God's not forceful. He invites you into a relationship with him. He's not going to twist your arm. He's not going to beg you to be friends with him. But you know what God's going to do? He's going to make it evident and clear. He's going to go to every extent possible to show you that he wants to have a relationship with you. That he wants to give you his joy. That he wants to give you his peace. That he wants to invite you in to be friends with him. So now, here's the way I see it. Some of us here today, we're not friends of God. Romans says this in chapter 5, verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. So much more that we now are reconciled. Shall we be saved by His life? Some of us here today, we have never asked God to forgive us of the thing that separates us from relationship with Him. The sin in our life. That we've never said, God, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. Transform me. Change me. Make me different. I want to be your friend. And others of us in here, we've, we prayed that prayer. But we never realized that our relationship with God could be more than a gas station where we just fill up. Could be more than, yes, even a coffee shop where we make time for him every day for an hour we sit down. To be more than a vending machine where we just take things from. That he could be our best friend. The one that we spend our entire day with. That he goes with us everywhere we go. That, that he directs us in our friendships. That he gives us an opportunity to check in with him every single day. That we can walk with God. Daily, That he doesn't have to be something that we just go to, that we get to be a part of. Jesus didn't come for religion. He didn't come to establish Christianity as a religion so that people could be religious. He came so that people could have a relationship with him. He didn't call us Christians. He didn't say, I'm coming and I'm going to die on the cross and I'm going to raise again so that you can be Christians. I'm going to just dub my name and you can be my people. You can be my Christians. At Antioch, they were first called Christians. It was actually a term of mockery. That people who weren't Christians were making fun of the movement of Christianity. They called them Christians. Little Christ. Jesus is not about us doing, but about us being. And the being is having a relationship with him. And he wants the ultimate. He wants our relationship to grow. He wants our relationship to be characterized by a good friend. That's what he calls us. So we have a decision today. If you don't know Jesus, this is your opportunity to say, yes, I need a relationship with God. I need to start there. I need to maybe start filling up once a week. And I need to start going to that coffee shop and learning more about God. And as I grow and as I mature in my relationship, maybe one day I'll kind of have a smartphone relationship with Jesus that you're talking about, Jerry. But no one's arrived. And for the rest of us who are here today, we have to ask ourselves that question. What's our relationship with God been like? I know that when I was in seminary, I got a master's of divinity. I'm studying the Greek, the Hebrew, the Old Testament, the New Testament. I'm learning the hermeneutic spiral, all these crazy theological words, the, the hyperstatic union. You know, you're looking at me going, awesome, Jared. Yeah. And that's how I felt. And I got so focused on learning details about God that there was this moment 
Right? For God to just have a relationship with God. I was focused on the do, doing and not the being. The being is abiding, remaining in Christ. We all have room to grow. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we ask that if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, that right now could be the time when they say yes to you. Or they say, you know what, God, I was kind of rebellious growing up as a kid. I did my own thing. I, I've heard about you. I've even been to church before. But maybe for the first time I'm seeing and realizing that you want me to have a relationship with you. That you know I can't be perfect. You know all of my faults. You're not calling me to just follow a bunch of rules, a bunch of do's and don'ts, but you're calling me to a relationship with you. And I get that picture of friendship because my friends that I have in my life, they know my faults, but they still accept me. And for the first time, I realized that, God, you know my faults and you'll accept me as well. If that's you, I want to challenge you right now to invite God into your life. To invite God to be your friend. And you can do that by praying, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus was your son and lived that perfect life in my place. And because of him, I'm not an enemy, but I could be a friend. And God, I confess my sin to you. I commit my way to you. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand where you are. Everybody's got their eyes closed. I just want you to raise your hand and ask God's forgiveness and ask for his friendship. I see it. Let's pray together. God, forgive me. I've made it about do's and don'ts and I've forgotten and maybe didn't even know that you could accept me even though I make a lot of mistakes. God, would you forgive me? And Lord, I want a relationship with you. I want to be different and new. Thank you for what you did for me, that you would call me friend. And God, for the rest of us here, Lord, I pray that each of us would walk away today encouraged and motivated to remain in you, to grow our relationship with you, to be best friends with you. Because it's for our benefit. You do it for our joy. We also become very productive for the kingdom of God when we're remaining in you. We bear fruit. And that's what we want to be about. We don't want to be known for what we're against. We want to be known for what you do in and through us, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming today. I want to encourage you to invite a friend with you next week to Anchor Church. It's going to be an awesome week. We are going to be looking at this idea of Jesus not just being your Savior, not just your Creator, not just your friend, but we're also going to see Him as your healer. And so next week we're going to look at Jesus as the healer, Savior. So invite a friend with you next week to Anchor Church. Have an awesome, awesome week. We'll see you guys next week.